Hello and welcome to Uzbek World News and my name is Bahram Gafarov. The Uzbek Ministry of Finance inked a memorandum of understanding with the United Nations Development Programme on March 24. The document aims at ensuring better alignment of issuance of Uzbek eurobonds with efforts to achieve the sustainable development goals, building transparency and accountability for national, public and investors. This agreement to strengthen the financing of national sustainable development has been made possible by the success of dual tranche of euro bonds issued in November 2020, worth 505 million US dollars and Uzbek sum of 2 trillion, respectively. The maturities in 2030 and 2023, the EBRD said in a statement. Activities under the signed MOU are to include elaborating impact measurement methodologies and supporting the conducting of impact monitoring, institution strengthening and trainings for line ministries. The ministry has also unveiled its intention to transform the system totally to an electronic form so as to combat shadow business in the country. My colleague has more. Deputy Finance Minister Dilshad Sultanov said that not only invoices but also consignment notes, powers of attorney, contracts and other primary documents on transactions will be drawn up in electronic form. Product labeling and barcoding will be developed as tools for controlling the movement of goods according to the scheme from the importer to the end consumer. As a result, the entire chain of commodity circulation will become transparent. Thanks to this, the tax authorities will stop the activities of cash structures. The latter will will not be able to issue the invoice for goods that they do not have. Uzbek entrepreneurs may soon be able to deliver their products to the retail chains of Walmart in China, as the Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Uzbekistan have established cooperation with Sam's Club China, a subsidiary of Walmart. The Chamber said it was assembling offers from domestic enterprises that were ready to use this opportunity. After considering all the proposals, the terms of cooperation with the Chinese company will be discussed, it said in a statement. Bukhara and Jizakh oil depots have revealed financial violations worth 6.5 million US dollars. Both factories have allegedly violated financial discipline and made unjustified payments to personnel. The documents were handed over to law enforcement agencies, the press service of Uzneftigas reported. The inspection revealed a shortage of 3.1 million litres of products at 67 farm fuel distribution stations of the Bukhara oil depot and 8 million litres at farm fuel distribution stations of the Jizakh oil depot. Uzbekistan has registered over 80,000 COVID-19 cases since the advent of the pandemic, gradually introducing both strict and easy measures aimed at protecting the population from the infectious disease, threatening the entire world community. More countries are now seeing cases of coronavirus reinfection, and Uzbekistan is no exception. According to Olim Jonis Hakov, the deputy director of the Special Hospital of Infectious Diseases No. 1 in Tashkent Zangyota district, some patients who have contracted coronavirus and recovered show symptoms of the disease again, and the repeated illness is often asymptomatic. Is Hakov urged for continued vigilance as the number of infected patients in hospitals has increased? Please don't forget about wearing medical masks, social distancing and the use of antiseptics to prevent the disease from spreading, he noted. Uzbekistan will tighten some quarantine restrictions from April the 1st. Uzbekistan saw a rise in demand for electric vehicles. The country imported 85 new cars worth 1.5 million US dollars just in two months. For comparison, 13 electric vehicles were delivered to Uzbekistan in 2018, 39 in 2019 and 131 in 2020. Most of the cars this year were imported from China. Among exporters also were Turkey, South Korea, the United States and Lithuania. Russia is intending to resume flights with Uzbekistan starting from April 1st, as well as with Germany, Venezuela, Syria, Tajikistan and Sri Lanka. The moscow tashkent flight will be operated once a week. The same frequency is provided with flights moscow Dushanbe, moscow damascus and moscow colombo The planes will depart from Moscow to Caracas twice a week. Russian footwear brand Kari is set to open a plant in Uzbekistan, with Charm Sanoat Association of Uzbekistan said on March 25. It will produce up to 10 million pairs of shoes per year. 
Curry was founded in 2012, and now it's one of the five largest retail chains in Russia engaged in footwear trade. The company has over 1,300 retail outlets in more than 300 cities in Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Poland and other countries. Following the opening, the plan will establish the production of 10 million pairs of shoes to be exported. The enterprise will be fully built with foreign direct investment. More than 1,000 jobs are expected to be created. Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan have struck a deal on the mutual delivery of up to 750 million kilowatt hours of electricity at nominal rate, as water at a key hydropower generating facility in Kyrgyzstan has dropped to levels unseen for more than a decade. According to a statement by Kyrgyzstan's Energy and Industry Ministry on March 25, the arrangement is designed to enable Kyrgyzstan to refill the Taktakul Reservoir, whose water is used to generate electricity at the eponymous hydropower plant and later to irrigate fields downstream in Uzbekistan. Levels at Taktakul have not been so low since the early 2010s, according to members of parliament who have raised the alarm. It could get yet worse, however. A leading energy official warned last month that at the rate at which water is being released from the reservoir, volumes could drop to as low as 5.5 million cubic meters. In February this year, Uzbek President Shavkat Mirziyoyev urged paying particular attention to water-saving issues. The irrigation season in Uzbekistan is said to use 25 percent less water this year, thanks to new technologies. AstraZeneca said on Thursday its COVID-19 vaccine is 76% effective in a new analysis of its US trial. That's just a tad lower than a report earlier this week that put it at 79%. But that was slammed for using old data, earning an unusual public rebuke from US health officials. AstraZeneca also stressed its 85% efficacy in the over 65s and 100% protection against severe disease and death. Those stats put it in the same ballpark as the other vaccines, an infectious disease expert told Reuters. What's also significant is that the trial of more than 32,000 people came after more infectious variants of the disease became prevalent. Thursday's revision should go a long way towards US emergency use authorization for the shot, which AstraZeneca will seek in the coming weeks. And it will help the firm, which developed the vaccine with Oxford University, overcome doubts over effectiveness and side effects on both sides of the Atlantic. AstraZeneca's vaccine is seen as crucial in tackling the spread of COVID-19. It is easier and cheaper to transport than rival shots, but questions have dogged the rollout. Earlier this month, more than a dozen countries paused use after reports linked the vaccine to a rare blood clotting disorder. The EU drug regulator ruled it safe, but many Europeans remain sceptical. Production glitches and export curbs by India and the EU are among other problems that have marred the rollout. Two sources have told Reuters that India has put a temporary hold on all major exports of the shot made by the Serum Institute of India, the world's biggest vaccine maker. That's to meet domestic demand as infections rise. And I'd like to think it's because I'm a nice guy, but it's not. It's in his first White House news conference since taking office, President Joe Biden pushed back against criticism over his handling of rising immigration at the U.S.-Mexico border, saying on Thursday that the overall increase was part of a seasonal trend that had also happened under his predecessor. Well, look, I guess I should be flattered people are coming because I'm the nice guy. That's the reason why it's happening that I'm a decent man or however it's phrased, that, you know, that's why they're coming, because, no, Biden's a good guy. Truth of the matter is, nothing has changed. As many people came, 28 percent increase in children to the border in my administration, 31 percent in the last year of, in 2019, before the pandemic, in the Trump administration. It happens every single solitary year. But the surge of migrants at the southern border has thrust Biden into an emerging humanitarian and political crisis. And while he condemned some of Trump's immigration policies, he said he would keep one in place that allows border agents to rapidly expel tens of thousands of people. But Biden said he would not deport unaccompanied children. The idea that I'm going to say, which I would never do, if an unaccompanied child ends up at the border, we're just going to let him starve to death and stay on the other side. 
No previous administration did that either, except Trump. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Biden said on Thursday that the vast majority of families are being sent back to Mexico under the Trump-era health order known as Title 42. They should all be going back, all be going back. But U.S. government data suggests that more than half of the 19,000 family members detained at the U.S. border in February were not expelled, with many released into the United States to pursue immigration court cases. Leaders of the European Union met for a virtual summit on Thursday in an attempt to grapple with the third wave of coronavirus surging in several of their countries and the ongoing disputes over their vaccination campaign, which has fallen far behind the United States and Britain. It includes their recent threats to halt vaccine exports, namely to the UK. Hosuk Lee Makayama is with the think tank, the European Center for International Political Economy in Stockholm. He says it could backfire. By doing the short-term priority, by trying to seize these shipments and trying to provide to Euro citizens first, what are you actually achieving? What can other people do against you? What kind of other bad behavior are you legitimizing as an EU? We have to remember that EU provides a quite a lot of legitimacy in the world. Whatever EU does is deemed as legitimate. And this is where actually a number of countries could, uh, either on vaccine or any future issue, uh, retaliate against the EU just by saying this is exactly the standard EU set. The EU has administered about 14 vaccine shots per every 100 people, according to the research journal Our World in Data. Comparatively, the UK, which only left the EU last year, has given 46 shots per 100. There are also internal disputes. Some leaders, such as Austria's Chancellor Kurz, allege that the vaccines the EU does have are not being distributed evenly. France's President Macron has said the failings are because the EU, quote, didn't shoot for the stars. That should be a lesson for all of us, he said. We were wrong to lack ambition, to lack the madness. Turkey said it raised the issue of Uyghur Muslims during talks with China's foreign minister in Ankara on Thursday. It came as hundreds of Uyghurs protested against the treatment of their ethnic kin in China. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi met President Tayyip Erdogan as around a thousand protesters gathered in Istanbul. Chanting dictator China and stop Uyghur genocide closed the camps. Some waved blue and white flags of the independence movement of East Turkestan the name by which the movement refers to Xinjiang. We are here because of the freedom of Eastern Turkestan for asking Chinese government to close the camps, uh, stop genocide against Uyghurs. China approved an extradition treaty with Turkey in December. With the deal awaiting ratification by Ankara's parliament, activists among some 40,000 Uyghurs living in Turkey have stepped up efforts to highlight their plight, holding regular protests in Ankara and Istanbul. Turkey's foreign minister, Mevlut Kavasoglu, who has denied that the extradition accord would lead to Uyghurs being sent back to China, said after meeting Wang, he'd conveyed, quote, our sensitivity and thoughts on Uyghur Turks. He added that Ankara and Beijing would enhance cooperation against the COVID-19 pandemic and on vaccines. Uyghurs' worries have been fueled by Ankara's dependence on China for COVID-19 vaccines, having received 15 million doses from Sinovac Biotech and ordered tens of millions more. Your business model itself has become the problem. In their first appearance before Congress, since Trump supporters stormed the U.S. Capitol, the chief executives of Facebook, Google and Twitter were grilled Thursday on everything from their role in the riots. I just want a yes or no answer, okay? Yes or no, do you you bear some responsibility for what happened? To proliferation of COVID-19 and vaccine misinformation, to concerns about the impact of social media on children, including asking questions about Facebook's plan to create a version of Instagram for kids. You have broken my trust. Lawmakers widely slammed the platform's approach to false or dangerous content. The three companies have taken steps to curb misinformation, but research has shown it is still widely present on the platforms. 
Social media has been widely blamed for amplifying calls to violence and spreading misinformation that contributed to the January 6th attempt to violently overturn the election results. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg defended his company's policies and tried to shift blame to politicians for stirring anger and distrust. We did our part to secure the integrity of the election. And then, on January 6th, President Trump gave a speech rejecting the results and calling on people to fight. I believe that the division we see today is primarily the result of a political and media environment that drives Americans apart. When asked if their company's platforms played a part in violence on January 6th, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey was the only CEO to say the company did bear some responsibility. Yes, but you also have to take into consideration a broader ecosystem. Thursday's hearing comes as lawmakers are calling for Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act to be altered or even scrapped. It's time for Congress and this committee to legislate and realign these companies' incentives. The law shields online platforms from liability over user content. In written testimony released on Wednesday, Facebook argued that Section 230 should be redone to allow companies' immunity from liability for what users put on their platforms if the companies follow best practices for removing damaging material. The hearing was virtual, but near the Capitol, an advocacy group erected cutouts of the three CEOs dressed as some of the January 6th rioters, whose images went viral in the days following the attack. One showed Zuckerberg as the QAnon shaman, a shirtless rider wearing horns. The state of New York is set to legalize recreational marijuana as lawmakers finalize language of a bill to be passed next week. That's according to two reports on Thursday, and it would make New York the 15th state in the U.S. to allow recreational use of the drug. The proposed bill would apply a 13 percent tax to retail marijuana sales and would eventually allow New Yorkers aged 21 years and older to grow plants at home. A key part of the pending agreement is aimed at making reparations for the war on marijuana's effect on minority communities. Studies cited by a marijuana advocacy NGO show that enforcement of New York's marijuana laws has fallen disproportionately on non-white people. The New Deal would reserve tax revenue from marijuana sales for non-white communities and set aside sales licenses for minority business owners, according to the New York Times. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is reportedly on board with the agreement, which could go to a vote in the Assembly and Senate as early as next week. Wall Street rebounded late Thursday afternoon as investors bet on stocks tied to an economic recovery and picked up beaten down shares such as Apple and Tesla. Earlier in the session, investors had shrugged off a big drop in weekly jobless claims that President Joe Biden called economic progress. By the close, the Dow gained six tenths percent while the S&P 500 added a half percent. The Nasdaq inched a tenth percent higher. Invesco Global Chief Market Strategist Christina Hooper is optimistic about the outlook for the economy and the markets. We have far more fiscal stimulus than we had during the global financial crisis. We have Fed support, I mean, extraordinary monetary policy support. And of course, we have in the offing the broad distribution of vaccines, uh, which should trigger a strong economic recovery. And let's not forget elevated household savings and pent up demand. A lot of that demand could resurface at restaurants. Shares of the operator of the Olive Garden and Capitol Grill, Darden Restaurants, shot up 8 percent after it announced a new plan to buy back shares. It also issued an upbeat outlook for revenue and profit. Nike was the biggest decliner on the Dow, falling 3%. The maker of athletic goods was attacked on Chinese social media over past comments it had made about labor conditions in Xinjiang. So far, these have been the latest news for today. Goodbye. Take care.